Okay, welcome. Let's start now. We are about 80 people in the live stream. That's uh, very amazing. Thank you very much for showing up. I start with a short introduction. Today, our guest is uh, Mercedes. She will talk about modern identity management in the era of serverless and microservices. I guess she will introduce herself uh, later on her slides and tell something. Uh, we, are, we are happy to be here, and this is only possible because we have some sponsors, uh, like uh, uh, our Platin sponsors. We have about five uh, gold sponsors, and we are happy to have about uh, 28 silver sponsors. And uh, so we have money to pay for the license for Big Marker and for our events. Uh, we have usually some catering. So if you visit us live, uh, then you will have some drinks, some food, and all this is only possible uh, because we have so many sponsors. Thank you very much uh, for all these uh, sponsors. So here in BigMarker, we have a chat. You uh, can see it usually on the right side. And the chat is for you, where you can talk uh, together all the audience and ask uh, questions and, and talk about the topic. And if you have a question for Mercedes, then uh, please don't post your question on the public chat. Please uh, switch to the Q&A and post your question for her on the Q&A tab. And uh, all the other people can vote on the questions. And uh, after the talk, there is a section where Mercedes will uh, answer your questions. And we start with the question with the most votes. So please uh, use this possible possibility. And uh, please vote for the most interesting questions uh, you want to hear. Uh, in the stream, we have a delay of about uh, 10 to 15 seconds. This is because uh, all the uh, screen sharing and webcams are sent to the server first to be optimized there for your device. So if you have a smartphone or a tablet, computer or a TV screen, you will get the uh, hopefully best uh, uh, resolution and quality of the stream. Uh, after the talk, when we end this webinar, you will be forwarded to a form where you can give us feedback. Uh, please, at the end, fill out this feedback form. And uh, if you have filled it out, you can leave your email address. And if you leave your email address, uh, you can win an IntelliJ IDEA license, which is a personal license for one year. So please stay to the end, and uh, then you can win this license. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, so the address is oh the address is missing here. So I type it in the chat. Sorry, it is uh, https uh, colon double slash youtube dot jack dot ch or yt dot jack dot ch, and you are on our uh, YouTube channel. And uh, hopefully, if everything works, uh, this uh, uh, talk is recorded and we will publish it later. So subscribe to us and uh, don't forget to click on the bell to get a notification when this talk is available online. Yeah, that's it. That was the introduction. So I'm very happy to introduce here uh, Mercedes to have her here, to, here today. And uh, I'm very interested in this topic. So, Mercedes, thank you very much for being here. And uh, now you can share your screen and take over. Thank you very much. So I will start to uh, print my presentation. OK, there is. So I hope that you watch it perfectly. My screen. So my topic is about modern identity management in the era of serverless and microservices. Um, for start is uh, explain that this is a communication or how we will handle users uh, between clients and uh, an 
and a REST app to be a serverless or no services. So this is not a talk about a server to server communication that is, uh, for example, how handle communication between your services. Uh, this is a, a different topic, uh, a little bit related with uh, tokens that we discuss them, but it's not about that because it's one of the most uh, frequent questions that I have. And I start asking this, and it's uh, why is it matters and what makes developers care about it. And if you didn't believe that developers don't care about it, uh, I will show you a few statistics, uh, and maybe uh, you will change it. your. So this is a little bit of US study for that of 2020. Um, so here we are watching that in the first uh, half of the year, they have an increase of the 50% uh, in data branches. Then they have reporters about the 3,300 uh, data branches were just in the first half of the year. Just in eight, those 3,800 uh, reports were exposed three to two billion uh, records. So this is a lot of records. Now maybe you know uh, this company that is called Equifax, that is the consumer credit reporting uh, agency work in UK, uh, Canada, and you. But they had a cyber attack, and I think that is a great example. But what was reported in that moment is like they had been uploaded around like 38,000 driving license details and also 3,200 for details. Also, they have information stolen, right? This is the information that was reported. The company confirmed that the information on about uh, one um, Four and forty-six of six million names. Also, the same amount of period were exposed. Also, by one hundred forty-five million social security numbers, or ninety-nine million others information. And the nice and payment numbers and expiration dates were stolen in this big cybersecurity incident. This is a lot of information and inform whether hackers can get fake uh, identifications or they can uh, stole identity from other people but so they have a uh, credit information from users so it's, it's really critical uh, this kind of cyber act so um one of the problems that we have that as usually something something's wrong we they care about security so i know that you are in europe Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, there's a yeah. bad audio quality. Uh, so, we have a problem with the audio quality. Uh, so maybe it helps if you shut off your uh, webcam. So please go to the uh, webcam icon okay. there on top and uh, choose turn cam off. Okay, turn cam off. Very. Right, because there were okay, some uh, problems with the audio quality. Okay, good. So I will continue. So you know the general data protection regulation in the European Union. So if you have these big cyber attacks, you will need to pay a fee to the European Union. But also uh, United States last year started with this uh, user data policy. So right now these things of security is uh, going a little bit more serious topics in other parts of the world. So security must be a goal in every development. And one thing that I want to say is that security is a team effort. And usually uh, the comments that we listen is like, no, security is responsibility of the security expert of the company. But then we have questions like our team have a security expert or also the company when I work have security experts. And also a security expert usually is not the developer or the person inside the team that will implement the security. So they only will give to us the strategies and the things that we need to make 
for implement security. And we have security in many levels. We have the network security, we have device security, the application security, infrastructure, data security, and also identity security. So this talk is about identity security. If you don't like this word of security, we can call this identity best practices. So this is a quite a uh, roadmap of all the things that we will touch in this uh, session. So we will start talking about REST API designs and something that uh, makes some developers run and how we can improve that. And we will introduce also JWTs, maybe many of you listened before about JSON Web Tokens. Then we will talk a little bit about the problems with the user credentials and what we are doing wrong in the industry for trying to achieve or force users to have great or safe credentials. And then we will introduce identity and access management and also identity management. And then we will have, a, I will give you a little questions or basically tips that we need to make before to start a project or have a successful identity management project and then we will talk about identity as a service and then we will discuss this in an architecture level and i have a, a small demo for it, cover all those things and uh, so um well my name is mercedes Biz. i am from guatemala that is in the other side of the world so for example here right now are at 8 a.m so I am a community leader here too. I have a female chapter of Java that are the Jade Duchess and also a community focus on uh, Google technologies. And I am starting co-leading other two uh, female communities that are by ladies and uh, women in data. And also I am part of the Mozilla community. And right now I am CTO in a startup that is based here in Guatemala. So we will start talking about the bad API design. So this is something that happened. Hey, I was talking with many people around the world and yes, happy. So we have our REST API that is the one that provide information. So we will have our client apps that will have that communication with our REST API. So one of the most uh, problems that we have in this bad API designs is when those APIs require to the client send the username and the password in every single request. So what is wrong with this approach? So the first thing is that we cannot ask to our users that they introduce a username and a password in every single request. So we need to resolve that in the client side. So what we do is save those credentials, for example, in the client apps. So if we send those credentials in the wrong way, we'll be exposed and anyone will can have that information. Also, if we don't handle a security in terms of the communication, this network communication between the client app and the red API, those credentials will be exposed to for anyone that is making a network monitoring. So how we can achieve this, and this is why uh, exist now protocols like OAuth. Exist other ones, uh, but this is like the most uh, simple and popular. So what happened here is that we have our clients and we have also our REST API. But now we will have this third guy that is called the out server, the authentication server. So we will establish that communication. And in this case, our clients will have a first communication with the out server, making a login or an authentication process. Then is when they send the credentials and this authentication server will make a validation to those credentials and will return, sorry, and will return, I make the back instead next. Okay. And we will return a token to our client. So now the clients will save these tokens. Also, we need to be careful with how we save those tokens. But it's not so critical if we don't do that in the in the best way. But depends on the strategy that we handle in for verify those tokens. So then the clients will have a communication with the REST API. And instead of send always the username and the password, we will send that token. So the REST API will have a communication with the authentication server, making a validation of this token. So this is the authorization process. In this part, we need to verify first that token is a valid token. The second thing is 
that this token really represent the identity of our system that they said that represent. And also we need to verify to this identity have the right permission for access the information that is requiring. This is something like uh, permissions or roles that we have. Um, why this part of verify that have permission is important? So for example, I give this uh, talk in, in other place and one person asks, but why I need to do that? If I am, for example, in my spring, I can make a JSON for configure what access have my, uh, my client, my user. And this is only in terms of the client side. So I am configuring basically visually what things can access this user. But that doesn't mean, for example, to a person or a hack can came and see all the endpoints that we have in a website and then try to access those endpoints. So the fact that we restrict visually the access to some user doesn't mean that they will cannot try to access throughout the endpoint. And this is why it's important that we also make a verification to a user it has the right permissions to the resource that is asking. So after that, the authentication server will answer to the REST API. And finally, the REST API will can provide an answer to the client. So answer with the information that he is requiring or saying, you know, you don't have the right permissions for this. Or also we can say, you know, your session is expired and you need to make a login again. So for implement those tokens is uh, commonly used now JWTs. Basically, JWT is an open standard that was created with the purpose to can uh, transport or use JSONs in an encrypted way. Always is used the powerful of JSONs, but with encryption. So when we saw a JWT, we will saw that. We will show a header and we will show a claims, but in an encrypted way. One of the problems that we have with this approach is that anyone can take a JWT and inspect what information is inside this JWT. So I can take this JWT, uh, look at web inspector and see what information is inside. So this is only use JWT could be uh, not secure. So we can, um, combine these with that usage of JSON Web Signatures. A JSON Web Signature add a signature to the token. And with this signature, we can verify that anything in the JWT was corrupted. So we can use uh, different algorithms with uh, only a private key or a combination or public and private key. So we have all these uh, signature algorithms. Something important about uh, encryption is that doesn't matter if we use a super powerful algorithm if we have Wake's uh, uh, keys. So we need to choose the right uh, algorithm and also we can choose uh, powerful keys too. And now, uh, well, one of the things that is happening now is that we are having in the future this of uh, quantum computing. So use a little bit loud algorithms, maybe will not be good. We need to start to prepare ourselves for this of the quantum uh, coming. And uh, we need to start to choose more powerful algorithms and when the new algorithms rise it. But uh, this is just a comment. So now, we will show a JWT like this one. We have a header, we have the claims, and we have a signature for verify that our token was not corrupted. So if we inspect uh, this uh, token, we will see that. So in the header, basically we have the algorithm that we use it for created JWT, and also we have the type of token that we are creating. This is standard that uh, JWTs have JWT, J, uh, JSON Web Signature, but also have other standards like JSON Web uh, Encryption or also JSON Web Keys, and exist other two ones. So this is why they add in the, in the header what type of encryption we are creating. Then we have the claims that basically is the information that we want to transport between the two parts in this class time, the, the client, and our server. And then we have how is created this signature for make that verification to our JWT was not corrupted. So we have something interesting here in the claims. So we have here the subclaim. Something important to say about JWT is that 
Well, we saw that it's a wrong approach saying that username and the password in every single request we can, because we cannot ask to, to the user, so we'll be saving in the wrong way those credentials in the client side. So that doesn't mean that now we will put the username and the password in our tokens. Also, this is a wrong approach. We need to create a unique identifier to every one of our users in the system. And this unique identifier is the one that we will put in this subclaim, for example. This is other approach that is not one of the official approaches for claims. But for example, if you want to verify in the level of the tokens what permissions has a user, you can use these scopes for the find. For example, they hey, we have a repo and they can read this. We have this GIS and they can write and of course read that information. So if but if you don't want to use this approach, you can also make an approach when verify the token and verify with the database which kind of permission has this user. So this is a strategy and will depend on uh, what are your needs or what you believe that is better. So other of the things that I uh, like to recommend here is this uh, uh, type that we have in the header. One of the problems that we have is that uh, usually we don't use only one programming language for create an entire system. So my clients can be made in other programming languages. So for example, if we make an Android application, we can use Java, we can use Kotlin, or we can make hybrid implementations using Dart in Pluter or making a React application. So we will different programming languages. And sometimes in all the parts of the system are creating JWTs, not only in the, in the REST API. So we need to choose a library that use this uh, type uh, claim in the same way in the header because some libraries uh, remove this type and then you have issues uh, validating the token just because this is missing. That is a little bit ridiculous. So we need to choose right uh, a library. So these are all the register claims that are defined, uh, but we can introduce all the ones that we wanted. So we have here uh, some interesting that JTI that is for define a unique identifier for the JWT. So this can be used uh, in cases when we will have tokens that only will be used once, uh, just have one time for being used. So instead to save all the token in a database, you can create a unique identifier and save that identifier in a database and you go and verify and say, okay, I used it before this token. So this will give you information if this token continue being valid or not. The next one that we saw in the example of the JWT is the sub that is for defined, what is the subject of the token or which identity is represented this token in all our system. The next one is the ESS, is the issuer of the token. This claim is used when we create tokens in different parts of our systems. So we will show uh, what one of the cases that we can use JWTs is not only for tokens in security, not also for exchange information. In a case of exchange information, we will have, for example, clients creating these tokens to for send to our server. So in this case, I would use an issuer that say that was my application, that one that created this token. The next one is the X for the expiration, is when we have tokens that have uh, expiration times. So we can have tokens that never expire, like happen, for example, with Facebook, that we have a uh, permanent open sessions. But for example, in financial implementation, we are usually have a sessions time. So we can uh, put these things in the token. So when uh, you expire this time and the token arrive to the server, you can say, you know, your session is expired and you need to make a login again. So what problems we can solve with JWTs? And we can uh, make authentication, authorization. We can also implement federated identities or make information change client side session or client side secrets. In this case, we are talking uh, about JWTs for sub authentication and authorization. And I have also here an extra slides for uh, define this again because it's, uh, it's other of the frequent questions. But uh, 
an authentication process is when we make a login or basically our client make a login in the REST API. So they send their credentials and we return to them a token. And that authorization process is after this login. In this case, our clients will will send this token and we will verify that this is a properly token is valid represent the user that say and also this user has permission to access the resource that they wanted so if you want to know more about JWTs, I suggest to visit this JWT.eu website. They also have uh, their, uh, an inspector for JWTs, and also they can recommend you uh, libraries for many different uh, programming language, and also this handbook uh, that say to you how to use in authorization, authentication, also for make implementation of federated identities and also for use it in information exchange. So we will continue. And now what we are doing is improve our API design in terms of the security, right? Related to users. So instead to send the username and the password, we now we will send a token. So now talk about the user credentials problems. So this is something that don't happen only with users, also happen with us as developers. It's like, OK, we need to put a simple password for make a test or things like that. So one of the problems with those credentials is that we are using a lot the single signing on. And something is the only method for make login in a system that we are using. And that is the weakness of these traditional credentials are well exposed in many times. Uh, so what we need to do is improve that. The problem with this is that in any hacking that the password were exposed, so hackers can use this password for game and try to break other systems. And this is because we are you as users and usually use the same password for all the systems because it's easiest. Remember just the same password instead to remember many passwords. So what is doing the development industry is creating rules. So they say, OK, if the user cannot create secure password, we will force them to create security passwords. So we will create the rules. And happen things like this one. So we have a grandpa here creating a new password. And this grandpa say, OK, hmm, you want a uppercase. So don't worry, we will have a uppercase layer. So what's nine? What's now? You want a number? So we will put a number. Now you want an special character? OK, perfect. You have an special character. And finally, he created password one, two, three with exclamation mark with P uppercase. So this is also a weak password What is filling all the rules. So we create other insane rules in the industry. So here is the joke, right? But your password will need to contain a uppercase letter, a number, a hieroglyphic, a father from a hawk, and a blood of a unicorn. So this is insane, but exist systems that you go there and try to make login and happen things like that. This is incredible, insane, that we are introducing our password, and then we make, OK, I quit. I will reset my password. And you put the same password and say, you cannot use this password because it's your last password. And say, this is not possible. So what we can do to improve this, post, uh, this process, make it easier and safer. So this is when we will introduce identity management. So how we can improve all this process and how we can handle all these of the identities. So in identity management, we will explore three concepts that are the core concepts of identity management. That is provisioning, account management, and identity governance. So one of the things that usually development industry forgot to is that our users, our identities, have a life cycle inside our systems. It's not only came and make a login and everything, it's OK. So I use sometimes system that also they believe that make a logout is just return to the login page. But for example, if we are in a website and I start to make him back, 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 or make an endpoint, I can see the information. So they don't click the cookies. Uh, they don't really close your session. So talk about provisioning. So this is a sign 
identities uh, to users that will be an entity inside our systems. So one of the things that we need to start to uh, make a division is that our users not always are actors in our systems. So many of the systems uh, have this user that will be accessing the system as the same actor that have a uh, information assigning and attributes inside the systems. So this need to be two separate things. And now I will explain uh, with the bank, uh, where is this of when an actor is not the same to a user. So first we have actor is the same to a user. So we have the bank and the bank have customers. And every customer have different kind of products and you have all them or just one. You can have loans, you can have credit cards or you can have uh, checking accounts or whatever. So what happened is to the bank have their system and they have their bank apps that they provide for access to this information. So in this case, that this bank customer that can be myself, for example, I will be a user of the system of the bank throughout these applications because I will access the application for see how many money I have. So I have money, I spent much money yesterday that I went to a party or what happened. So I am the same user of the system and also an actor in the bank. But what happened when it's not the same thing? So we have actors, but it's, it's not the same to the user. So we will change these customers and instead to have like persons, we will have a company. So a company can have an account there to, for, a, for example, pay to the employees. But if this is a big company, so the owner of the company, the owner to these accounts in this bank, this actor in the bank will not be the same using these bank's applications. They will have an accounter, for example. And this counter will be the user in the bank applications, in the system for access these uh, products that this company has with the bank. So in this case, the actor of the system will be the company and the people uh, that is the represent of this uh, company. But we will have a different user that is not an actor that is the counter. So the counter just will access the bank application for see the products of the company and for example make the payments or to the employees or services. We have other case when we have users that are not the actors of the system. In this case, we will have these bank receptors. So I can go to the bank, for example, to change a check. And in this case, uh, the bank receptor will take the check will verify that have the account have money for pay that check and will make the transactions to uh, quit that money to the account and give that money to you. In this case, again, we have a user to all these systems, but it's not an actor. And we need to separate these uh, two things because uh, in identity management, we need to provide and guarantee to the information to those users will be properly saved and handled. So finally, we have in provisioning, we need to start taking in mind that it's not only human beings, the one that is accessing a system. So now we have robots, we have IoT devices, and we have also voice user interfaces accessing a system. So we have different kind of users, and this is why we cannot define users as the same actors of the system. The next thing that we have in identity management is the account management, is how I guarantee that those identities will be uh, properly handled, will be safe handled, all this information. So here we have many things, is how we maintain those identities. So how I will say that in a data database will be in a different database. Uh, this is not related with approaches with microservices. It's not about a general system and then the OAuth system, right? So I will handle this separate or in the same one. How we will save those data. 
So I will use encryption algorithms or I will delegate just in a level of a database. So I will use a special database that we mail encryptions. Also, we need to define things like how we will handle those identities. For example, when an identity is eraser or is not longer available or an so here is when we define a privacy policy. So exist many systems around the world that don't have any privacy policy. The next thing that we have is an identity governance. Here is when we define roles to our users or permissions. But one of the things that we have too is that uh, define that maybe this identity we can access many systems. So one of the things that I saw in some companies here in Latin America, for example, is that you went to a company and they have multiple systems. But one, uh, the same employee in the company have different credentials for every single system. Why? Because the, every si system was made in isolation from others. So what will be the correct approach in this case? If you are an employee in a company and all the systems are for the same company, we need to use the same credentials for access all the systems. So in identity governance, we need to visualize two that have a system for handle identities that can be works for different systems, like Facebook do, for example, that they provide to us the federated identity so we can implement that in the systems and provide a users other uh, ways to make a register and a login. And also this is really good because we don't need to remember uh, many passwords. So we have just one, the Facebook one. So this is identity governance. Then we have the identity and access management, that A I A M. This is something that we saw many, many, especially we are using clouds. So what happened here is that here we are defining something that we have, we call this in this way, the right individuals to access the right resource at the right times for the right reasons. So here is when we have process like authentication, authorization, and identity federations. Here of the identity federation is when we make this implementation like Facebook is what I was saying to you. Uh, in identity governance, what we do is define how we will handle this. But in this case is how is when we make this implementation. So we will start talking about these three things and we will start in the easy one that is the authorization. So basically, this term refers to a wide range of concepts uh, within this IAM space, but essentially is for controlling what our users can do inside the systems. So again, is that we really verify that they have permissions to access the information that they wanted. And they also that our tokens are valid tokens. So now we will talk about identity federation. So this is when we make those implementations. So I put here all these icons that are basically for Facebook applications. So we have here, for example, Facebook, the Facebook app general, they call it Katana. Then we have Facebook Lite, the Orca Messenger, the Messenger Lite, we have Creator, Pages, Moments, Announcements, Analytics, Workplace Chat, or F8 event. So what happened with all these uh, applications? So, for example, imagine that I download the Orca Messenger and I make a login in Orca Messenger for can use it. But then I say, okay, I want to the Facebook application and I came and download the Facebook application. I don't need to make again a login in the Facebook application. Why? Because I made that before in the Orca Messenger. So uh, this is the magic of the Identity Federation is uh, permit to the user if we make a login in one, Application, we don't need to make that in the other one. Then now, talk this about uh, the web, the browser. So here we will talk about the same origin policy. Uh, this is something that was a, a problem when all these of the identity federation started. Why? Because the same origin policy established that 
two related domains or two different domains cannot access the cookies in a browser. Only the same origin or say this domain that created those cookies can access those cookies. And that is a problem in this approach to have two different. So in this case, uh, talk about these Facebook applications in terms of domain. So imagine that we have domain one that will be Katana app and we have domain two that will be Orca app. So if I make a login in Orca, I save my token in the cookies in the browser. But when I came into Katana, Katana cannot access those tokens. So identity federation say how we can fix that, how we can uh, make that two related domains can have access to this same information what without violating the same origin policy. So there when we started this of the identity provider or a security token service that now we uh, meet like the OAuth server or the authentication server. So they say we need this third guy that will be the one that will handle this information. I have here other more complicated diagram, but explain things in a better way. So we have this third domain that is the authentication server. So now I can came to Orca perfectly, make a login, but now Orca domain will not be the one that will save those cookies in the browser. He will communicate with the authentication server and it's the authentication server, the one that will save this token in the cookies. So now when I go to Katana and want to make a login, Katana will uh, make a communication with the authentication server now. So the authentication server, okay, wait for me. I will verify if we have some token, save it in our browser. And also if you have, have permission to use this token and will return to Katana, you know, yes, perfect. You are logging here. So this is uh, identity federation and is when we make the implementation to this authentication server for provide this uh, authentication to different systems. And this is other of the reasons why we need to start to think in our user in separation to the actors of a system. Why? Because we can have different systems and we want to this same user access to those different systems. So if we are handling this in the same way, we will cannot give this approach to systems. So then talk about the authentication section. So here is how a user will make the login. So obviously we have the single signing on that is put a username and a password. So we will not talk about the single signing on. So we will start talking about other one that is federated identity or federated identity management. This is different than identity federation. In this case is when we are using an identity federation. So for example, that we use the Facebook identity federation for permit to the users make a login or use our own identity federation implementation in the case of a company. So we have many ones. It's not only uh, a world of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, GitHub. Um, so we have other ones in social federated identities. I will show you here pictures, but I will give you the access to those slides then for you saw all these options. We have also enterprise federated identities. And also we have some legal federated identities, basically in, in Europe. So I talked once with a guy in, in Sweden and he said this is, this is a really great approach. So for example, they use this federated identity for make a login in all the uh, government websites and make a process in the government, take a new driver's license or a password. And they say that is really good. So we have many, many, many options. So now talk about multi-factor authentication. So what happened with this problem with single signing on? So in one moment, uh, the industry say we need to improve that uh, far away for uh, force users to create secure passwords. So then when they establish these three things, so now they are making login with something that they know, but we also can make that with something that they have or that is that possession. And also with metrics, that is something to the user is. So in this case, we make uh, the single signing on and then we can introduce a token, for example, that we have from those devices. We can make a face recognition or a fingerprint. 
And this is what we know as multi-factor authentication or also verification in two steps. So for example, Google has this of uh, you make login and then they send to you a code to draw SMS to your cell phone. Um, this is basically a multi-factor authentication. Uh, this is other application that is called Gordian. So in this case, you make a single signing on in a website and that generate to you our QR code. So you have Guardian that is an application and you can scan this code to the website. And throughout Guardian, you will provide access or deny access to this website with your credentials. So for what can work that you give or deny access uh, through an application or in a web browser through an app in your cell phone. So I always put this example uh, when we are uh, university students and we went to use the university lab for so our Facebook, for example. And then you run away uh, outside because you are going late late to a class and you forgot close your session. I don't know if that happened uh, in Switzerland. Uh, I also saw one person that was connected from um, Portugal, um, but here in Latin happened a lot, but always is someone looking uh, who forgot close their Facebook. And then you are a victim about that. So if you forgot doing that and then you are running to a class, you can remember that and say, I will deny access to that Facebook because I forgot close that Facebook in some computer that is not my computer. So you can allow your permissions or deny that permission. So this could be good. So then we have the biometric session. So the common methods is use the fingerprint or facial recognition. We also can use iris uh, recognition. Um, I saw that in some buildings now, instead to use these cards for access to the building, they are using the iris recognition or the facial recognition. You also can have voice recognition, type recognition. Uh, right now we have uh, some cell phones that came with this of uh, type recognition. So for example, if you, uh, someone else take your cell phone, the same phone, we say, you know, you are not the owner of this cell phone because you are not typing that this person. Uh, we also have DNA usage all these like Edna Moda in Incredibles. So we will continue now with other of the options for make login, that is the passwordless option. In passwordless really mean uh, provide a user access without a password. So we are trying to make the users don't create password or don't use them in the best way. So for example, this is a flow when we can use passwordless, um, but also we have this of, of multi-factor authentication. So this is for companies. So we can have, uh, we will verify if uh, a user is accessing to the application in this case from a range of IP address. This is when uh, we are using a VPN, for example. So if this is the case, uh, we will make other verification and the next verification is see if this user is in a geofence. So is physically in the place that he said that is. So for example, now that we are making remote home is like we really are accessing the application from our home or if we are in the office, but it's, it's not the case. So we will make a multi-factor authentication. So in this case, it's a flow that in, in the part of the flow, they permit to the user than access with the use of a password. Then we have the touch ID that basically is the fingerprint. One of the interesting part about the fingerprints is that are unique. So we can use that as a unique identifier for a user. In this um, flow, we are watching that. Well, we make a read of the fingerprint, we validate that. So we will show if that fingerprint exists in the system or not. If don't exist, we create this user. If not, well, oh, if not, we create the user. If exists, we go directly to generate a token and our user is uh, properly logged. So also we have the SMS codes. Um, just like with SMS codes, I always suggest that use also uh, the user created before a password. Um, because uh, SMS not always work. And if you are in a trip and you need have a, Grooming, you will then receive these SMS codes. So we also have the magic link, and I maybe will assume that all of you know Slack. 
because Slack is really good with magic links. So a magic link is no more than you receive a link in your email and you can make login with this link. Uh, this is a great approach, for example, when we need to verify to uh, email address is a uh, correct email address that user really was the one that registered with this email address that is not a fake one and so users can use it for make a login in the case of slack uh, they only provide the usage of uh, email address to this magic link uh, when we are making login in a mobile application when we are making login in a desktop application or in the browser we need to introduce uh, the password so how we can have a successful identity management project taking in mind all those things so returning to what things we do wrong sometimes is i will repeat again is like developers forgot that users have a life cycle inside our systems so it's not just make login and everything is okay other of the things that happen a lot in the industry is that always that we have a new project. If we don't work in a company that have a product, it's like, you know, we need a user's uh, section. So you copy all the users, user's module that we have in this other project and we will use in this new one. And what result that sometimes we need different approaches for every single system. So we need to evaluate what things need every system. So the first one is that we need to see how these accounts will be created. So one of the things that is happening now is that we are migrating many, many legacy applications to the cloud. That means to these users will need be migrated to. So it's not always about uh, or this is one of the things the other thing is like some systems uh, provide to the users with uh, the rights to they make a registration in the systems in other systems uh, the users receive an invitation to create an account and exist other user systems that create those accounts and you receive an email that say welcome to this uh, system uh, this is our your credentials or this is a link for you create your password so all those things need to be evaluated also with the uh, with the clients uh, how they need for these systems well with the right approach then is uh, if we are making a synchronization is how all those how all those users will be synchronized between the legacy application and the new application. Um, also, in that we need to verify if we will be synchronized all those users or we will need to create them from zero. I, I think I have other slides about that. The next thing is about username uniqueness. Uh, not always will be um, an email address, the uniqueness that we will have about usernames. Also, we can uh, ask to users that they create a, a personal nickname. So for example, when we are using uh, federated identities like Facebook or Gmail or Twitter, so for example, I can use the same email address for all those uh, social, yeah, in Twitter and LinkedIn. So what happened is that some systems permit to me have a different account inside that system. So it's one with uh, Gmail, one with LinkedIn, one with Twitter. Also, when are the same email address? And this is because for them, the email address is not the username uniqueness. So this is something that we need to evaluate if we will permit that or we will require to the user make a fusion uh, with all these uh, social media accounts. The next one is how will users make a login? So I need to use single signing on. I will uh, force them to use multi-factor authentication. I will provide to them some passwordless implementation. So for example, now that we are in this of the streamings, I was testing something that is called a stream jar. So for example, a stream jar, I just put my email address. It's, it's not any like registration or something like that. I just put my email address and then send me a code to my email address and I can access. And this is how I created an account and how I will make login all the time. So other of the things here for make logins is ask if we really need to make a multi-factor implementation. So maybe we are, uh, 
adding this two-stage verification, but the system really don't handle any sensitive information or high sensitive information for demand this level of security. So why we will force users to make multi-factor authentication and it's not needed. Also, we need to evaluate if we need a single signing on or we can remove the single signing on for our system like StreamYard made. The next one is what devices will be used. And this is really, uh, really important. And especially uh, for we can handle a history of devices that are being logged in the system. So that helps to us for verify, for example, if someone is trying to hack an account or we are having a uh, run or suspicious attempt of logging. So if I usually I am using an Android uh, mobile device, if now I am using an iPhone, this is something that I need to turn on another and say, you know, we are receiving or we make a login through an iPhone application. So was you or wasn't you? Or I usually I, ha I make that through a LG and now I am making that in a Motorola. Also in devices like computer or browsers. So I usually this person use uh, a Chrome and now is using Firefox. The next thing is um, like me, for example, WhatsApp. In WhatsApp, I can join devices and I can see all the devices when I open a session. And I also, I can close those sessions throughout the application. This is something like uh, this application of Guardian that I can uh, define it uh, if I give permission or not. So allow or deny permissions. So for example, if I open a session in another computer and then I want to close that session because I forgot it, or I change of computer, or I forgot, I lost my computer, that happened too. Or here in Latin happened that someone stole your computer in some event if you don't have uh, care about it. So you can uh, handle those things. The next thing is what happened when a user decided to make a logout. Uh, this is what I say that is not just read back to a user to the login page, you know, we, can, we need, really need to close the session, don't permit to after a logout, the user can access to things if they make a logging out. So we need also erase in the properly way our cookies or any session that we have in a client side. The next thing is, uh, this is about uh, browser configuration and is stronger related with uh, cookies. So I use it, the, they fix it that now, but it's a really, really big teach company. Um, and always that I use something of them uh, and I forgot close my session, then when I return and my session was not any more valid, but I also I cannot close the session or make a login again, they always show me a website that say, you know, your, uh, your credential or uh, we have an issue with you and you cannot use that. But I know that I the only thing that I need to do was clean my cookies, but uh, usually a normal user don't know what are cookies and how clean those cookies. So we need to be careful about that because could be something that we make users don't use our applications. The next thing is uh, session timeouts. Maybe our system need a session timeout, but maybe not. And also we need to define will be that time of those uh, session timeouts. So for example, financial applications, are really strict about these of the session timeouts. I think the most biggest session that I saw there was 50 minutes and I think that this is much, but for example, other financial institutions only, only have two minutes of session timeout. So if you don't have communications in two minutes, you can do nothing more in your system. Or we can have systems like Facebook, like have open sessions, so you don't have a timeout. Then we have that deprovisioning is what happened when things are over. So here is about our privacy policy and how we handle things when a user decided erase an account. So what will happen with the information of this user? So we saw sometimes that they say, okay, you are erasing your account. So you have one week uh, for decided if you really want to erase all these permanent or not and you can return here or something like that. Or we will save your information during six months because we don't know if we will need it. Or I always say that, but 
uh, usually most of the systems don't have issues about this, but maybe in your system, people can come and make something illegal inside the system, and you need to apply some kind of, of uh, I don't know how to say that in English, but it's like uh, make a Twitter or Facebook, for example, that they cancel your account for one week, one month, or close that permanently, but sometimes you just not can just came and erase that. Usually it's a legal subject and depends or each country, but you need to define these things, uh, define those things and establish this in your privacy policy. The next one is that password reset. This is really impressive, but exist some systems that don't have any password reset implementation. So if we forgot our passwords, we cannot access any more the system. It's like, it's no way. So we need to remember those simple things. The next one is blocked users. Uh, this is for systems like Spotify, for example, or Netflix that you need to pay. And in one moment, you don't pay, for example, and they have a pro uh, policy that says, you know, if you don't pay in 50 days, uh, so we just will block uh, your access until you pay or you can cancel uh, your account. Also, if you cancel your account in terms of payment, you also need to define what will happen if the people have a fit to pay. So for example, in Amazon, um, happen that you have something to pay, you can make a negotiation. For example, uh, I happened to me once with Amazon in this example. It's like I turn on, turn off a database, but I didn't know that Amazon turned on this database uh, one week after. So for me, that was off and uh, was generated no money. And then after a few months, I have a, a lot of fee to pay. And I say, what happened here? And you say, OK, you know, you can pay for this. We understand that. Or you can cancel your subscription, but you cannot use your account never again. So I say, OK, cancel this. This just was for test. But this is one strategy, for example. Also, blog users happen in these cases like social media when people are making uh, bad comments or are receiving that we can report incidents or bad incidents about one users and you apply this so we will block your account for one week or one month the next one is anomaly detections and this is related with the devices right detect when someone is trying to hack you it's not only related with devices too also with ip addresses it's like Okay, you are in Guatemala, usually you are logging with IP addresses in Guatemala, so why are you logging now in an IP address in Switzerland? So it's you or it's someone else. So also we have attempts with wrong passwords. So um, this happened again in other of these uh, big tech industries. I have a friend, I have an account there. Um, they always was receiving attempts to hacking. So the company what makes with these fake attempts is block the can account. It's like, okay, you have three failed attempts to make a login, so we will block your account. And then he called and said, you know, you blocked my account. What happened? It's like, you are introducing a wrong password. I say, no, but it's not me. It's someone else wrong, but it's your problem. So you need to detect those anomalies and provide to users say, you know, this is not me. We need to block this user that is trying to hack our account. The next one is a privacy compliance. And um, so maybe with you it's not a problem, but for example, here in Latin America, we have a lot of people that ho don't have a privacy policy, uh, never write nothing about that. So we need to have always one, we need to define to the user and explain the, uh, how we will handle the information, which information we are collecting from them, Especially, uh, for example, in mobile applications. So why I'm requiring these permissions, for example. So are really important things. Then we have the logs. Um, this is quite interesting, but sometimes when we are making tests, um, for example, in a REST API, we are printing there the JSONs that are coming for so those JSONs, but also we print JSON that have sensitive information like passwords. So we need to uh, don't print those passwords or those uh, JSON or sensitive information when we go through production. We need to remove that from our logs or at least make a strategy for encrypt the sensitive information if you want to see uh, all these uh, JSONs. Uh, 
Um, then we need to also uh, take in mind how all this information will change throughout time. So maybe frequently, for example, in financial applications are really great examples, but um, certain time they say to you, you know, we need that you make a information actualization. So we need to know again your name, uh, where is your direct action if you are working in the same place or if it's a new place so sometimes we need uh we have this information that can change and we need to require to the users uh that they make an actualization in this information so what happened here is that there are many things that we need to implement and sometimes could be impossible to do that if especially we have less time and this is one of the reasons why the developer industry have usually copied the user's module that have another project in a new project because that reduced the time to production. But sometimes this is a wrong approach because uh, what we have implemented in this user module don't apply to the new uh, system. So exists this of identities as a service. And this basically are software that we can use uh, in the cloud for make all this for us. So we have the popular clouds. We have Azure Active Directory, Oracle Identity Management. We have Firebase Authentication. Uh, we have uh, in Amazon, we have Cognito. Um, the people from Google Cloud initially don't, they didn't have an, a proper implementation. They make a partnership with the people from OutZero. Just that now they are uh, creating his own implementation. We also have other ones popular like Keycloak from Red Cat, Okta, or the people to WSO2, and we have other providers. So I will not talk about uh, them. I just include them for you know that all those guys exist. We can use them uh, for make all these of the identity management instead to make us all these implementations. So now talk about the architectural level. So we have a REST API, right? And our REST API could be a monolith, a microservice, or a serverless implementation. So what happened with microservices? So in this case, we have here the identity provider. And we also have uh, this other guy that is called the API Gateway. And now it's really popular. So our client, like we saw at the beginning, we will have a communication with the identity provider for obtaining a token. So for make the authentication process, they will send their credentials and obtain a token. Right now, then the client will have a communication with the API Gateway. So the API Gateway is the one on charge to filter if our request is, uh, is a valid request. So in these architectures, the API Gateway is the one that we have communication with the identity provider for verify to that token is a valid token that really represent the user that they say, and also have that right permissions for access the information that they want to consume. So then when the API Gateway receive that affirmative answer from the identity provider, the out zero server, so we'll have that communication with the microservice. But if not, the API Gateway will return to the client say, you know, this is not a valid token or your session is expired or you don't have permissions to that. Also happened the same in serverless. So we have their the authentication server. So what happened, for example, in the approach of serverless is like we have this uh, function as services. And what happened is that every single request has a function for them. So we will avoid the fact to ruin a function if the request is not valid. We will delegate all this responsibility to the app in gateway. That happened in this of microservices and serverless architecture. So now I have a, a demo uh, for show you how to make this of the validation of the token. Exists a lot of uh, app gateways. Uh, first, I will change um, all these. These slides, also the demo is in my GitHub repo, so you can obtain the, all this in the repo. I will put that and I will explain what will happen in the demo. So, exist many API gateways. I will use one that is called Express Gateway, and I will show this in a simple ways. We only will verify to the token is properly signed and also uh, is not expired for can move to a set of uh, 
serverless functions that I have hosted in Firebase function. So now I will remove this and I will show you here Visual Studio Code. So I will came here for show you. Here I have just will show you my functions. Okay. So I have three functions hosted in in first. So I don't know if you see well, but I will do so. Okay. Better. So this is just for you watch it here. Now I will switch to Express Gateway and I will explain you how I make a configuration of this Express Gateway. So I will return here, we close this thing. Okay, so I have here the Express Gateway. So I have here a directory that is called key that is in the same level of my conf. Um, I am using out zero for generate those tokens. So, but I will do, don't, so this is not part of the demo, but I don't know that the key that I use in the out zero identity as a service for generate my tokens. So, and I add that one to my GAPI gateway here for make that verification of the tokens. So now uh, I will show you this of the gateway config. So first we will uh, define uh, how I will handle this, if it's for HTTP or HTTPS and what will be my port. The next one is define the API endpoints. So the API endpoints is, I call this like the last names of my domain. So how I will redirect these things. Mm, so here I will put a host that is an asterisk that defined that doesn't matter what kind of uh, domain is. Could be localhost, could be jokeswitzerland.com, whatever. Then we have the path that is basically this last name. So it's this domain slash hello world or validate JWT or email. Uh, then I have the methods that I will uh, permit in this case, I put only post. So I have a hello world API endpoint. I have a validate JWT endpoint. And I put uh, this one a different name that is API email for you see that don't need to have the same name. So also then we have the server endpoints. In this case is OK, each one of these last name will redirect to one of these uh, endpoints. So in this case, I just put the name and the URL for each one of those functions. So here you will put also the, this endpoint that redirect to your microservice. So then I have the policies that I will verify in each one of those uh, pipelines. So I established the JWT for verify my token and the proxy always is need to be defining in this example of the express gateway. So then I define it the pipelines, what will happen. So I put the name of the pipeline, uh, where well, I have mother IDM and I have here my API endpoint. So I put here the same name that I defined here in the API endpoints that is hello world. Then I define the policies and I put here JWT. So I have here in action and I am saying, you know what? I will verify this JWT with this, uh, key that I downloaded and I have in my directory key. And I will not check if exists or other uh, credentials before. And then we have the proxy and here I put the action that will be the service endpoint that is the one that I define it here. So I put again the hello world and I will say that I will change that. And I make the same thing for the other one that is validate JWT and the email pipeline. So now I will move here to other software that I have that is called Insomnia. So Insomnia is for test um, REST APIs. So I have here my local host in the port 9000 and the last name Hello World that I define it here, right? That is this one, Hello World. So now I have here one. Uh, all token that I generated, and now I will send that and send me that I am unauthorized. 
And why is that? So this token is properly signed, but it's expired. So now I will go and I will uh, have a new token for make this demo. So I have here the new token. I will copy the token. I will return to my express gateway and I will copy the new token. So now I will send this. And now return me the message that I have in my Firebase function that is hello from Firebase. So for example, I will uh, modify something here and I will send it and I will say me that is unauthorized because it's, uh, my signature is not, well, basically it's not properly signed or is uh, wrong here because the encryption was uh, modified. So I will make the same here with this uh, validate JWT. We copy here, I will see how, okay. Now I have, a, I send it here a message. So I will send this. And I am receiving my message. So I think that this is really, really small for you per se. Function call from Guatemala from Guatemala to Duke, Switzerland with a valid token. And say me, my valid token was this one. So this is a really, really simple demo of how this works. Um, so for example, Express Gateway don't permit to us make much things. And every single cloud has his own uh, API gateway, so you can use them. So now I think that we will go through the section or for questions. So I will stop to uh, share my screen and I will put again my camera. There it is. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I will go um, read instructions and trying to answer all ones. Here's a one that say, question regarding identity federation. Assuming you use two services, it is safer to use two different unique passwords or it is safer to use a single authenticated service. So what happens you authentication to the out server gets intercepted. So, I don't know uh, this concern about what if your authentication request the out server gets intercepted. So one of the things to identity federation in this is provide to the user the way to only use one set of username and password of credentials for access a system. And I usually focus, uh, for example, in case of company, use in systems that have uh, Come say that is like are related, right? Um, so, for example, we saw many systems using Facebook as a way for making the logging and the registration. So, what happened if our authentication request to the outset were get intercepted? So, I I mean here is the question that what happened if any system is intercepted in an authentication way? So will be the same risk. Uh, it's not a difference using an identity federation than other specific systems, it will be intercepted. So in this case, is why how can be intercepted and system? This is why we need to also add unity in network times. So you need to have uh, your certifies, you know, SLT certifies for every travel encrypted throughout the client and the server or any part of your system. Also, some uh, system, especially financial institute, institutions, also make extraction and information, not only the certificates, if not, they also make encryptions to the JSON or any other thing. So, I mean, if your request is intercepted, this is why you will uh, encrypt this uh, communication between two parts for issues about that. But I think that uh, the part of the C is intercepted don't have any inconvenience with the fact that you are using an authentication server. So this is something concept 
differently. Also, you can have that in the same system. So then we have other one that is which or outflow should I use when I when system no user interaction to access a service that is protected with OAuth. So uh, this is an interesting question. So OAuth uh, define different flows. Uh, if you are using a web browser or a mobile application, also an, an IoT uh, implementation. So for example, for IoT, that is no user interaction, for example, you don't use a set of credentials. Uh, one of the things that you said there is uh, specifications. So you install a certification in your IoT device, and the certification is the one that is sent uh, to your system the authentication process. Uh, one of the problems that have people in IoT with this certification sometimes is when they make creation of the certifications. Certifications as don't have always a permanent, if not, you need to uh, make a refreshment of them. But yes, exists uh, different flows for, flows for any one of those cases in OAuth. Let's say if you use a centralized said identity provider, example, does this automatically mean that provider knows about all the services? I am allowed to use can the ID provider perform profiling based on my allowed location? Well, I really am not understanding this question. So what are the concerns about that in the in the person that asked it, kind of explain a little bit that. Um, because he say here, if the, for example, Google automatically, yes, tell me. Yeah, um, maybe we get some problems with the audio again. Maybe it's better to switch off your, your camera. I think it's uh, okay. some, some bandwidth problems. Okay, there is. So I am uh, reading this one, that is, if I use a centralized identity provider, example, Google, does it, it automatically mean the ID provider knows about all the services I am allowed to use? Can the ID provider perform profiling based on my allowed applications? Um, well, I think that this is more about, for example, how kind of information the identity providers are obtaining from us. Um, this is what I, I understand in about uh, this question that is from guest 917. Um, so yes, it's, it's possible also in that if you are not using something as identity provider, they can know uh, which applications are you using. So for example, in Chrome, uh, or, mm, I will start from other parts. So what happened when we are watching things in Amazon, for example, and then you went to Facebook and Facebook are recommending you all the things that you watch it on Amazon. So you don't need to make any login with your Facebook account on Amazon. Uh, they only are watching what we are doing. So this is why we use, I have an application in Chrome that is called Ghostery that block all these uh, background application that are trying to evaluate all the things that we are doing. So this is not about what identity providers are we using in other applications. So this is something that is happening in the web. And um, also, for example, Firefox uh, is trying to block those things for we can have a heal, healthy usage of the web. But I think that further from use an identity provider that can evaluate all the things that we are doing in the cloud or in the browser or wherever, uh, doesn't matter. So they are doing that instead when you don't want to do that. So then say, um, which public authentication service do you trust the most? And is it possible to use your favorite out servers to log into Facebook and GitHub, or do you have to use different out services? Okay. So, public authentication service. 
So I will assume that a public authentic. Hmm. Well, I mean, I can prefer use Facebook, for example. But what happens if the website, when I may, will make a registration or a login, don't have Facebook, just have a Gmail, for example, or only have a LinkedIn or on GitHub? So hmm, I don't have any preference one. The only thing that I really say is that you need to be careful when you are using those things in a website. And I would put an example about that. So when we use Facebook and uh, you went to a website and you are in the same browser and you have an, a Facebook session open. So and this website are requiring to you introduce your Facebook credential. This is for two things. They can make a fake implementation about uh, Facebook or they are installing your credentials. But about public authentication services, the only thing that I will say that I never will use is YouTube. No, it's not YouTube, it's Yahoo. Why Yahoo? Because Yahoo always is being hacked. But for example, we don't see that Google is hacked or Facebook is being hacked and our credentials are being exposed. So I don't have a like, preference about that, just concerns about other ones like Yahoo. And then say, do you have any pros and cons of validating the tokens at that gateway or at each application, for example, with a Spring security, especially since applications might be interested on user details or the roles stay at the JWT. So here exists uh, one thing. Um, the fact that we make a validation in the API gateway doesn't mean, for example, to a token never arrive it to our implementation in a Spring, for example. What we are doing is don't delegate those process um, to the microservices or to every single service that we have. So I am trying to reduce the amount of validation that is doing in that side. So for example, in Express Gateway, the, the demo that I make right now, I just validate to the token was properly signed, was a valid token, and also was not expired. So when I am sending that to the spring in this example, uh, I am not validating those. I am assuming that I have a valid token and I just will verify, for example, in that case, that this token have access to consume that information that is required. So we can have, uh, in this case of the tokens, valid the tokens in different parts of the system, but not all validations. So we want to reduce that amount of validations. So in the case of serverless, uh, this is critical because you will ruin a function just for make validations over a token when you can do that in an API gateway and never run a function and pay for it when you don't need that. Uh, you will not delegate any uh, concurrency or uh, I don't have the word, but you don't will make process just for these uh, simple things. So, but doesn't exist nothing that is the best way. Uh, I don't believe on that, that say, oh, this is the best approach for do something. You can evaluate that. If you want to make all these validations in the Spring security, okay, this is, this is how you are handling your systems. But I think that delegates some level of responsibility to the API gateway that is not needed in your microservices or your serverless uh, will be good. Then they are here correctly, the token is encrypted. I will say encoded, right? Well, could be encrypted, encoded, depends to what define any one of you. Um, so basically, uh, the tokens, uh, the JWPs, is for transferring information uh, in an encrypted way, supposedly. But if you want to call that encoded or say that I am saying wrong, but maybe it's OK. I am using the wrong words. But um, yeah, there's a, this discussion here on the questions. So uh, it can be encrypted too. So it can be encoded and encrypted. Uh, someone was uh, um, made a citation here from the JWTIO website. So 
Okay. Would this belong together? All these three, uh, four questions here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'll tell. Okay. I don't know if we continue with that or. So I, I think uh, we are finished because uh, the other three questions are answers to the other question here. So. <laughs> okay. So we are done. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you here. A lot of information in a very short time and a very, very interesting uh, thing. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to you too. Yeah, uh, and uh, so now I will end the webinar. Uh, please be patient. It takes a few seconds to end the webinar and you will be redirected automatically to a feedback form. And please fill out the feedback form and we will forward all the feedback uh, to Mercedes uh, too. And after the feedback form, you can leave your email address to win an IntelliJ IDEA license. And uh, please uh, take a look at our website. Uh, there we have a lot of uh, uh, other events coming on soon. Maybe there are some interesting for you. And uh, if you want to see the recording of this talk and uh, recapitulate everything, uh, please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we will make it uh, available soon, hopefully within the next few days. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mercedes. And uh, have a nice evening. And Mercedes, uh, have a nice day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.